Good morning. Again, we will try announcements and see if we can get everybody in. Uh, a couple of things. First off, first off, there is in the parking lot out front a Dodge van. If you came driving a Dodge van, the alarm's going off. Truck, a Dodge truck, sorry. Then the alarm is going off. So if that's you, hmm couple of announcements that I might call your attention to. If you've got your order of worship, please notice a um, couple of things. If you have not signed up and are participating in the soup supper on Wednesday night, first off, we would love, love to have you. And there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex just to kind of give us an idea if, in fact, you are coming. If you'd kind of help us with a number, that would be helpful. The other is if you are interested in helping us with a dessert, that information would also be helpful. And so please look for that. If you are any ways musically inclined and are willing to put forth practice effort with us, Wednesday night starts choir. And we are eager to be able to have that start. It will be immediately following soup supper. So we get to come eat and be able to then worship together through music. Uh, if you're interested, see Rodney. He'll answer all your questions. The other is, thank you, thank you, Tom Post, who's willing to help us out today. If you are willing, interested, available, any of those, to be a lector on Sunday morning reading scripture with us, please, I need your name. There's also a sign-up sign up sheet out in the narthex to be able to assist with that. We would love to have you help us lead in worship, and so that would be very helpful. Um, you see other announcements there. Please take a look. 
Um, hopefully, the newsletter for this week will be out this afternoon, I hope. Uh, and all that is to say, please, dear God, have her back soon. Ashley is supposed to be returning on Thursday back into the office, we pray. So um, I, I found out that my gifts are not as, um, my gifts of time are not as wonderful as they used to be. So I'm eager to have her back with us. We're so glad to see you all with us this morning. We're glad to see some of our travelers home, the Scotty, Amy, Sarah, thank you. We're glad to see some uh, returning home folks with uh, uh, the Millers having their family home with them. We're just glad that you're here with us today. Please show your welcome to each other and let them know how glad you are that they are here to enhance your worship. Greet each other, shall we? Praise the Lord. Don't want to rush it. As you return to your seats, gather your thoughts, gather your focus, pray as we begin to worship together. Pray for those of us who lead in worship. Pray for those who participate in worship. Pray for God's presence in a very special way as Dustin leads us into worship. If you will, please stand with me for the call to worship. Lord.
Lord, we come to worship as imperfect people asking for your forgiveness when we fail to recognize the rights of others to be different. When we demand others to accept our ideas while refusing to even consider theirs. When we seek the thrill of discovery without the hard search for truth and the torment of doubt. When we want things to be different but oppose any change especially if we are the ones who need to change. When we expect our church to be what we ourselves refuse to be. When we belittle our faith by believing the church exists only to meet our needs. God, help us to grow in faith by finding the amazing different ideas and views of those we call sisters and brothers. Help, help us to be open to the unfamiliar as we worship together this day, help us remember that we seek in things agreed upon unity, in other things liberty, and in all things the will to be one. Amen. As you remain standing, take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 390. We'll use the tune that's used for in heavenly love abiding to sing eternal Christ who kneeling. Eternal Christ who gives when earthly task are done, turn unto God appealing that they may all be one. We thank you for your vision of you. With which your church was born. But we have often slighted the ties designed to hold. Your followers united within one common fold. On history's tattered pages. We see, O oh Christ, with shame, the strife which through the ages has marred your church's name. Accept our deep contrition for all our sons. It still is from your mission. Which mark our words of praise. Christ, may your spirit guide us that we may find beyond the things which still divide us. Love's all embracing one. Please be seated. Our New Testament reading Our New Testament reading is from James 2, 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works? when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. 
Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Hear the words of Scripture. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. In your insert, you'll find the hymn, If We Just Talk of Thoughts and Prayers, it's printed in your newsletter this week. Join me in singing. We'll sing it to the tune we use for Jesus Shall Reign. Grayson, Grayson, Good morning. Good morning. I have a question for you guys. Grayson, do you believe in dinosaurs? You do. Have you ever seen a dinosaur? A real one? No? Then how do you know there was a dinosaur? How do you know? What do you think? Have you read stories about dinosaurs? Have fossils of dinosaurs. Oh, so you've seen evidence of a dinosaur. Okay, very good. So even if we don't see something, sometimes we can see the evidence of it and know. Is that what you're saying? Okay, all right, good, good. Have you ever seen hmm, the wind? No. Well, but do you see the wind? What do we see? How do we know we have wind? 
we can feel it. And do you ever see, if you look real close, you'll see the leaves kind of moving just a little. Do you know we get to see the effects of wind, don't we? Did you see a couple of months ago when we had wind here and that great big old tree out in the side yard fell down? Did you hear about that? Well, the trunk is with the bottom root ball is still over there. So sometimes, even if we don't see something, we know that it's there because we see the evidence of it, don't we? Well, that's sort of like how it is with faith. Have you ever seen God? Well, how do you know God exists? Just like how we have with the dinosaurs or with the wind, we see the effects of God. When we read the stories, much like what we read stories about about the dinosaurs, uh, we read those stories in our Bible. Our Bible has lots of information about God. Granted, we don't see God, but we see what happens when you and I do what God wants us to do, and we see what happens when we live out God's Word. Things change. Things happen. And that's because God loves us and God works with us to make things happen here on earth. We're going to talk today about a word that all of this is about, and it's about faith. Sometimes we don't ever see things, but we have faith that it actually exists. We're going to talk about that today, that God is real. God has a plan for us, and God wants us to follow that plan and live it out. And so we're going to talk about that today as we have the rest of the service. You listen for that. But can we thank God for being with us? Can we pray and have, have prayer together? Let's do that. Dear God, thank you so much. Number one, God, we thank you that you exist and that you are always with us. You live in our hearts, you live in our minds, and Lord, yes, you live in our world. Thank you, dear God, for being with us and showing us every day the evidence of your existence. Help us to see your presence in all that we do. Amen. Please join with me as we enter into a time of corporate prayer. Lord, sometimes faith comes hard. Sometimes it comes easy when we feel the breath of your Spirit upon us. Comforting, leading, tugging, whispering. And sometimes we cry in agony for a word, for a touch, for a sense of your presence. We come today seeking. We come today hoping. But do we come today willing to open ourselves to the terrifying, awful power of your touch? Your ability to mold us, to make us, to break us if necessary. Help us to be yielded and still, seeking your will as we gather, as we come together as part of your family of faith, as this expression of your family in this community, in this part of the world. Help us always be ready to show by our actions and attitudes that we are your people and we know what it means to love each other and others around us. And Lord, today we do come with many on our hearts, a world and a nation in turmoil. We take these moments to share those things that rest heavy upon us with you and with others. Bud.
And Lord, thank you for guiding us. Thank you for giving us words when we don't have the words to say and to use as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our gospel, or excuse me, for our New Testament reading. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, 8 through 16. Now faith is the essence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understood that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen has made, was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren. And because he considered him faithful who had promised, therefore from one person and this one as good as dead, descendants were born as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Hear the words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. As you're being seated, take your hymnal and turn to number 316. 316, we use the tune that we use for my shepherd will supply my need to sing we limit not the truth of God. Yeah. 
In the months we've been here, from what I know of our church here, there have not been many preachers to come into this pulpit and declare in their best imitation of Billy Graham, the Bible says, usually when a preacher says that, means they're going to tell you their interpretation of what the Bible says about this or that, and if you disagree with them, uh, they usually a disagree, they accuse you of disagreeing with the Holy Bible. Now, my home church, the First Baptist Church of Pompano Beach, Florida, was a conservative church, though it had and still has a very conservative doctrine and understanding of the Bible and the Christian faith. Somehow, we were encouraged from the nursery on through Sunday school and youth ministry to ask questions and to study the Bible for the answers. We did get some of that, the Bible says, approach, but we were still allowed, even encouraged, to ask questions, and sometimes even to a degree, when we disagreed, we were still accepted. I was challenged, as were all of us young men, of course, teenage men, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a worker that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My mind had not reached that enlightenment about non-gender yet. And study I did. I dove into apologetics, which is the religious discipline that's committed to basically defending the faith through systematic argumentation and debate and discourse. I read every word of Josh McDowell's two books in his Evidence That Demands a Verdict series. I read all of Francis Schaeffer's books, like He Is There and He Is Not Silent, How Should I Then Live, and the other 20-plus volumes he wrote. And I studied them. I believe that God had called me, as 1 Peter 3.15 said, to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Again, I still hadn't got that inclusive gender thing yet. I was definitely lacking in the meekness part of it, though. Then I went to college. I had the pleasure of living on a hall of a dorm that was made up of over half ministerial students in that hall of 18. We young male defenders of our faith discussed everything about the faith that we could think of and debate. We even came to call ourselves the Second Floor Theological Seminary because we were doing as much learning there as in the classroom. Our accepted theology in the classrooms, though, was being challenged by good, faith-filled teachers who began to blow our minds wide open, challenging us to defend our interpretations of the Bible while showing us these good people, these intelligent people, that there were other interpretations. Most of us had, like many here, been members of only one church or had stayed within churches that were the same denomination or belief system that taught basically the same. So our perspectives were surely limited. Now, Norris Religious Fellowship is very unusual in many ways, but has had the blessing of having two long-term pastors who taught and led in such a way as to never force their beliefs on somebody from the pulpit. Many of us have not had the opportunity to be part of a church like this one. But slowly, year after year, through college and seminary, and as my faith 
met hard on the realities of life and serving churches through the years, I realized I did not have to be a defender of the faith, that somehow, without me, the faith had survived fine for thousands of years without my brilliance. I don't know how. <coughs> my closed mind had started to crack open. I saw that those who preach the Bible says, like Charles Stanley and some of the popular TV preachers, were really saying that you had to believe what they were telling you the Bible says. And if you did not, we had the privilege of being called liberals, skunks, and enemies of the faith. I started to realize that maybe being a Christian was not about defending doctrine especially when no one could agree on all the doctrine that was being expounded, but maybe it was about how we lived and acted. I came to realize that it was so much more important to live at being Christian, or rather acting Christian, than stating a certain set of beliefs that I was required to state to truly be right with God. Eventually, for me, it came down to looking at faith through the filter of what Jesus said and did, not first what the rest of the Bible said. Because the Bible says a lot of things. The Bible says the Moabites are bad people, not fit to live with Israelis in Deuteronomy 23. But then the Bible tells the story of this wonderful woman, Ruth the Moabite, who became an ancestor of Jesus. The Bible says that people from the land of Uz are evil in Jeremiah 25. But then the Bible devotes another whole book to the story of Job, a man from Uz, who was the most blameless man on earth. The Bible clearly says that foreigners, eunuchs, and others are not to only be allowed, are only to be allowed as fringe parts of the kingdom and the faith in Deuteronomy 23. But then in Acts, an African eunuch is welcomed into the church and baptized. Slavery, racial purity, women being silent in the church, men being the head of the household while intent on making that a thing of power and domination, condemning homosexuality, eating pork, and on and on and on and on. The Bible has been used to defend all kinds of positions. Jesus said there are two things. Two things that summed it all up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Looking at the Bible through the words of Jesus changed how I looked at what has become one of my favorite Bible verses, top five Bible verses, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the essence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for. Now, I used to think that meant that I was to give substance to all those unseen things through my defense of the faith, my intolerance of those who weren't, as I saw it, Bible-believing Christians. I gave substance to heaven and the resurrection and creationism by fighting the good fight and talking the talk because the Bible said this, and I understood it to mean this, so I must stand firm for the faith. Discovered there's such a thing as bible -olatry. Bible olatry, where one makes the Bible an idol to be worshipped instead of worshipping the one we seek through the Bible's pages. I remember a song we sang in our youth choir back at my home church that definitely falls into the category of Bible olatry. In it we sang, Faith is the essence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for. God's word has said it, and I believe it, and that settles it for me. And don't get me wrong, I believe the Bible is inspired by God with all my heart and all my mind. Though I have trouble sometimes defining that and understanding that, I believe in an afterlife, some kind of heaven, renewed creation, as God's kingdom comes here on earth and look forward to it, hopefully. I believe that something happened about 2,000 years ago and that somehow in some way, and I know all the theories and explanations, somehow Jesus lives and is real to us today. I do believe the purpose of the creation story is to affirm that 
God is behind all that was created. The Bible tells us who did it. Science tries to tell us how it happened. The Bible says all these things and more, but they're not always easy to understand or interpret. And the older I get, I find that I am absolutely sure about less and less. This morning's Hebrews passage contains in chapter 11, verse 2, telling, uh, continues in chapter 11, verse 2, telling us that by faith our ancestors received approval. And then goes on to tell us about some of those ancestors. Now we skipped part of the passage this morning because of time, but it talks about Abel, Enoch, and Noah, and then jump, we just jumped to Father Abraham. We read how Abraham obeyed God when he set out for a place while not knowing where he was going. He moved, he acted, he and Sarah obeyed by doing. Abel offered, he actively gave. Enoch walked with God, he didn't sit around waiting on the Lord. And Noah certainly did something, he built an ark. They show us that faith is not primarily about belief, it's about doing. I lived as one who was concerned with what I should believe, but what it means to understand and believe being a Christian was all about, right doctrine and theology. I followed a list of thou shalt not, instead of first loving others as I love myself. And maybe, like many others I've seen through life, maybe it's because a lot of times our love for ourselves is lacking. Jesus said that faith is about loving God and loving others. It's about being Christian, about acting in a Christ-like manner. Why hasn't the church at large learned that no one cares about the details of what we believe? The world only cares and sees the part about us loving others as ourselves. Why do you think most Christians are labeled hypocrites? Even the world knows more about how the supposed followers of Christ should act and talk than many in our churches. In the rest of the passage in Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16, all of these, all of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed they were strangers and foreigners on this earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city, a place for them. Their substance of things hoped for was a homeland, a better country, a heavenly kingdom where God has prepared a place for them. They believed they were headed in the right direction, but they did not have the certainty of knowing. They looked for the substance of things hoped for, a place, a time where evil and injustice would no longer reign, a time and a place where all the broken things in their lives and beings in the world would be made whole. They looked forward, not back, and they did something to get there. They traveled, they built, they acted, even in the uncertainty of the unsurety of faith. Isn't that who we are? At times, we are overwhelmed and seem to only have trials dark on every hand. And we just want to live in the hope of the sweet by and by. But not only do we have to journey to move forward to get there, we also are called to start bringing the kingdom of God into reality now. It's not a future thing. When we pray, God expects us to be willing to be Christ's hands and feet. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, are we willing to work to do God's will and bring in the kingdom? To make the rough places plain and the crooked straight. We have the hope, not the certainty. We have the hope of our faith. Will we act upon it?
You may ask me, why do you serve the Lord? Is it just for heaven's gain? Or to walk those mighty streets of gold? And to hear the angels sing? Is it just a dream from the fountain that never shall run dry? Or is it to live forever, ever and ever in that sweet old by and by? But if heaven never was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life, living in a world of darkness. But he brought me the light. If there were never any streets of gold, neither a land where we will never grow old, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, but he brought me the light. He's been my closest friend all through the years. And when I cry, he dries all my tears. It's been worth just having the Lord in my life, living in a world of darkness, but he brought me the light, living in a world of darkness, but he brought me the If you would, take your hymnals. Stand with me as we sing our hymn of response, number 537. We'll sing it to the tune we use for Take My Life and Let It Be, and we'll repeat the last phrase. Christian, rise and act your creed. Let your prayer be in your deed. Seek the right, perform the true. Raise the work and life anew. Raise your work and life anew. Hearts all round you sink with care. You can help their Lord to bear. You can bring inspiring light, strengthen them to do the right, strengthen them to do the right. Offer others hope and joy, and God's worship you'll employ, giving thanks in humble zeal, burning all God's will to feel, burning all God's will to feel. <coughs> Come then, Lord, divine and reign, faith that doubt assails in vain, perfect love bereft of fear, 
God bless us with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. God bless us with holy anger and justice of breath and exploitation of so that we tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all God bless us with the gift of tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and loss, so that we may reach out to comfort them and share our joy. God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we really can make a difference in this world so that we are able, with God's grace, to do what others claim cannot be done. Your kingdom come, O God, we pray as we journey forward in faith. Amen. On your insert, you'll find the words to a closing chorus. Join me in singing, May the Road Rise to Meet You. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rain fall softly on your field and until we meet again, until we God hold.